Hello and welcome to Ditching Hourly. I'm Jonathan Stark. Today I'm joined by guest Mike McDermott. Mike is the co-founder and CEO of FreshBooks, the world's number one cloud-based accounting software for self-employed professionals. Prior to FreshBooks, Mike ran his own design firm where he accidentally saved over an invoice and realized an unmet need in the market. Mike also authored Breaking the Time Barrier, a guide to using value-based pricing to unlock your true earning potential, which has been downloaded more than a quarter of a million times. Please stay tuned. My interview with Mike McDermott is next. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. For the maybe one or two people who don't know you in the audience, could you tell folks a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, Mike McDermott, co-founder and CEO of, of FreshBooks. And uh, what FreshBooks is, is a ridiculously easy to use invoicing and accounting software that's in the cloud. Uh, so you can use it on your phone, you can use it on your desktop. And it's really uh, the thing that makes us different as accounting software goes is we're built just for people who send invoices. I've uh, been at it for about uh, 10 years, about 20 million people use the software since we started. Um, and uh, as I like to say, if you invoice, you need fresh books. And I think maybe just to set context as well by way of intro. So that's what I do today, uh, founder and CEO of that company. Um, but before that, I was running uh, a, a consulting firm, I guess, if you will, a small one that I built up and built into a small team before I saved over an invoice and decided to start this fresh books journey. So, <laughs> so I think, um, I guess between uh, those two uh, parts of my career, uh, hopefully we've got some fertile ground here to explore. Yes, absolutely. Uh, okay, so so you know one thing about FreshBooks is that it has a time tracking feature, uh, but I, you know, but I also know that in 2013 you wrote this book with Donald Cowper called Breaking the Time Barrier. I imagine there's a little bit of a tension there. So I, what I'd like to do <laughs> first is start with what caused you to write that book. What was the trigger event that that made you want to write that book? So I wrote Breaking the Time Barrier with Donald, as you uh, point out, um, because I, one of the things we've always done at FreshBooks is gone out for dinners with our customers. So I fly to a town, a conference, something like that, and I'll go out for a customer dinner and invite like all our customers in that region out, meet them, have dinner. And I, I kept hearing some of the same things over and over with people. And because we serve businesses who send invoices, um, they had you know a lot of consulting businesses, marketing firms, agencies, all these uh, kinds of folks. And I, I heard the same problems kind of over and over, or I would be able to say, oh, I see where you are in your development as a firm. And I remember being there. And, and so uh, it was, it was interesting. I'd be trying to coach people up on this, this journey of like, oh, you're, you know, kind of interacting with clients and, and pitching proposals in this way. And I found other ways to do that, that were more like this and uh, they were helpful. And so I'd be coaching these people up one-on-one -on -one, and I said to myself, geez, I've had enough dinners with enough people to know that like, this is a big problem. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it certainly was for me and, and kind of got to the other side of it. And so, uh, how might I help others do that as well? And so I said, well, this would, uh, this would make for a great book. And so, yeah, wrote breaking the time barrier, tried to keep it, uh, uh, easy and consumable. So it's free and, and takes less than an hour to read, but it, it kind of, uh, it, it gets into basically how to move beyond billing by the hour. <laughs> right. Right. And so I want to call out one quote that I think will really uh, grab people's attention. Uh, toward the beginning of the book, you you say that, you know, you tell the story about saving over the invoice and thinking, you know, I, I, there's got to be a better way. I want to build this software product to address this issue. Uh, and in order to get the time to do that, you, I, I think I have this correct, you went, you, you decided to take this approach. And you said in, in one year, you worked 19 days and generated over $200,000 uh, of revenue to fund the development of FreshBooks. Am I repeating that correctly? That's correct. Yeah. I think it was actually a little more than that, but yeah. <laughs> yep. Feel free to elaborate. I'm, I'm sure people will be very interested to hear this. Well, what I managed to do, uh, and in fairness, uh, I did get a little support from a couple of people on my team for parts of this, but I was paying for the, you know, them as well and redirecting all these funds. But yeah, I, I worked 19 days because I had figured out how to make a big impact for my clients, um, you know, w without it necessarily taking a ton of, of my time. And, um, and so I had happy clients and I was able to have the flexibility to, to do other things. So like, that's basically, you know, uh, you know, 11 months of the year, I'm able to focus on the startup I was passionate about. Excellent. So the book is, it's, it's got a wonderful sort of structure to it. It's kind of like a fable. 
where you tell the story of, of Steve getting laid off at the beginning. He decides to go freelancing. He talks to his friend, John, John gives him some advice that turns out to be actually kind of bad. And it, actually I, I'd like to kind of drill into a couple of things there on this, because that's the position that a lot of people are in, you know, the people you have dinner with, the people that listen to this show, lots of them are in this position uh, where they're sort of asking their friends like, Hey, what is everybody doing here? And they're getting advice from people that have been doing it, but they have no way to tell if the other person really knows what they're talking about. Yeah. So one of the, one of the bugaboos that you actually mentioned and just drives me crazy is when someone is starting out, them getting the advice to go figure out their hourly rate in an online rate calculator, which to me, like that is a gigantic red flag. If someone suggests that you do that, do not listen to that person. <clears throat> it's, can you could sort of give your, your, um, what are your thoughts there? Well, yeah, I think, so I, I think there's some value in that approach in terms of like getting some baseline because you're probably groping around at this stage in your career to try and figure anything out. Uh, and so like having a tool like that can give you like a sense of like, okay, at least I have some purchase here. There's a, like, there's some kind of number that's not from me that gives me a sense of where the market is at. Um, but I just think it's, it's not the right way to think about, you know, serving your clients and, and what to charge at all. Uh, and for a whole bunch of reasons, which we'll probably get into over the next hour or so. Um, and so, um, you know, back, back to your, I think that the bigger problem you're getting at is like, how do you know if you're getting good advice? And, yeah. um, I, I think that's a tough one, right? And I think, yeah, I think a lot of people in their careers, um, they get some advice, they get going, they find a working model for doing things, and then they don't necessarily revisit it. And I think that that is a shame, right? I think you have to always be wondering, what am I missing, right? That that to me is like, what what do I not know that someone else out there does is kind of a question that keeps me up at night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> always, right. always has. And so I think, you know, having that mindset, if you're out on your own, uh, and that could be like, oh, geez, how do I, it was this thing I forgot to do for the client or um, or it's like, geez, am I really like, you know, you know, how valuable is the work I'm doing for somebody else? Could they be charging more? I've heard other people do like just anyhow, I, I think that constant uh, paranoia about like not knowing something is healthy mm -hmm. and, um, it will probably lead you to more evolved ways of looking at and thinking about building your business. And I think people can get comfortable or, you know, just find something that works and be too afraid to change it. And I think, you know, I, I guess I'm talking philosophically at this point as an answer to the question, but like, I think a lot of philosophy is wrapped up in the answer to that question. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. So to bring it down to the ground level, how would somebody go about getting that kind of information? You know, I mean, I could make some suggestions, but I'm curious what you think. As in like find their way to reading something like breaking the time barrier? Yeah, that, or like uh, pushing, pushing themselves out of their comfort zone, stop resting on their laurels, seeking out mentors, get joining masterminds, yeah. things like that. Yeah. And by the way, I think those are all part of the puzzle, right? There's like, you could luck into finding this book at like the perfect time earlier in your career that changes everything for you. Or maybe it's, um, you know, you've got to constantly be, I think trying to find advisors that like are a reach for you, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, is a great way to go. Like if you're talking with your peers, it's great. It's a good support group, but you're probably not growing or going to grow at the rate you need to, right? Like I think those are different things. Are you looking for support? Or are you looking to grow and challenge yourself? Because chances are your peer group are not going to grow and challenge you the way somebody who's like a few levels beyond is. And so maybe it's you got to go. One thing I did early on, just for example, I was working by myself out of my home as a freelancer when people thought freelancing was crazy. And, um, you know, I, I found out about this. It was uh, I was building websites for people. I found out about this agency who is you know, having a lot of success building for other folks. And I, I got in touch with the owner of that agency. I was like, you know, I'm going to take you out to lunch. Let, let me just suck your brain. <laughs> and, uh, and that's, that's what I did. Right. And I just kind of laid myself there and I was like, I don't know. There's all this stuff I don't know. And he told me something like he spent a quarter million dollars a year on rent. So like $20,000 a month. And my, like my mind exploded because I was like working <laughs> out of my home and making like no, I was like, I could not believe it. But I, I think exposure to, it's like, you know, they say you're you know, the, the average of the 10 people you spend time around or whatever. But I think you have to find ways to get in touch with people who are, you know, ahead of you on some kind of journey. And that's where something like Mastermind is great. Uh, you get exposure to those folks. But, um, uh, yeah, you got you got to find your way to like, hey, your peers are great for support. But there's something else someone else out there has got to give you. And 
you may not know what it is, but try and find that person and get to them and, mm -hmm. and keep repeating that, that process. Yeah, you have to watch out with the peers about the sort of devolving into commiseration. And mm -hmm. and the, the thing that I see frequently is that the freelancers sort of gang up with each other against the clients, the clients. in general. Yeah, that is like you're so far off script. Yeah. It's yeah. not even funny. I, I will give a plug to um, for lots of software folks and things like that in, in this audience. So uh, Bureau of Digital. Uh, run by Carl Smith. Don't know if you know him. I'm a good person to get on the show. You maybe you've had him before. Forgive me if I missed that. But um, they do really interesting things. So here, here's a great way to uh, like. Here's a group of people. They bring together pretty evolved agency owners. They have a series of events, but one of them I think is called Owner Camp, and they bring together a series of uh, pretty evolved agency owners, and they, they bring in experts and they do like a, it's like a panel of like 20 people. So you're all kind of growing together. Uh, like, cause you've got a peer group of 20, but then you have these experts who are pushing you all a level higher. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I think that's a, you know, another great way to do it. And so uh, if you're, if you're running a digital agency, check out uh, Bureau of Digital, but if you can find something like that, maybe in another industry or what have you, I'd encourage you down that path as well. Mm, plus one, definitely. Okay. So there's one thing I want to drill in there. Um, I, I know from talking to lots of people that there are, there are listeners in the audience who are like, yeah, yeah, that would be great if I could just call up, you know, some amazing uh, firm owner and take them out to lunch. But why would they say yes? They're not going to spend any time with me. Can you sort of calm that person down or perhaps refute that that gut reaction? Well, and, and so here's, um, I, I think that's a great excuse. Right? Like, you, you know, it's like, uh, sorry, folks, you know, there's, yeah, that's like, life is not like that. Like, so do you want to get better or not? And if you do, then like figure it out, right? Figure it out. Like, that, yeah. And maybe it's like you got to look them up on LinkedIn and find that person who you knew in high school or, or what have you. I, I got in touch with one of their clients who then got in touch with them, who then introduced me. Uh, and like the deal was, I'm going to take you out to lunch, right? So, you know, I, I guess I was sufficiently compelling, um, you know, uh, that they kind enough to, uh, go, go out with me. But like, I, 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 these are the problems in life. You need to figure out if you're going to get, uh, moving along. And I, you know, I, I get how it's hard and you may see the obstacles with that, but I would say just like, you know, buck up, right? Like sitting around <laughs> saying it's hard, yes. uh, is not, it's like, well, then you're not going to solve any problems. You're not going to get any better because you're not you're, like, you're, you're seeing the first obstacle and stopping dead. I, you know, just, it's, it's no way to be. So <laughs> there's some tough love for everybody today. Yes. I'm a big fan of tough love, right? It's like, you're not willing to do these things that seem, you didn't even try, but they seem challenging from the outside and then wonder why you're stuck. Yeah. It, and that's just, and wonder why you're stuck. Like look in the mirror, right? Like, right. And, and by the way, that's a mindset change and it's hard. Uh, and so hopefully if, if that little bit of tough love helps one person, uh, I'll be grateful. Absolutely. Okay. So speaking of the person you spoke with, there's someone in the book who sort of resembles that character, probably an amalgamation named Karen. And Karen is the person who poor Steve talks to, uh, it's sort of this, this sort of scenario where he finally gets some advice from someone who knows what they're talking about, or, or let's just say has a completely different worldview. And they sort of walk through something that the listeners of the show. It's be interesting. I, I, I'm going to say, forgive yeah, me please. for interrupting me. Sure. I actually think, I mean, what you just said, the, um, somebody who has a completely different worldview, I actually think that's probably the sign that you're talking to the right people. Mm. You know, back to the commiseration. If everyone's saying the same thing, you're stuck, right? Mm -hmm. So the question is, are the people around you saying different things that either you don't quite get yet, or maybe you don't quite agree with? but they're forcing you to think differently. Mm -hmm. That's a good metric for, am I speaking to the right people? Am I reading the right stuff? Uh, and sorry, I just thought that beautiful opportunity to double down on uh, what we just said. So with that, uh, sorry, let me uh, let you get back to leading us forward. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. And uh, like a side comment on that, uh, I'm in a, a number of online communities and I could tell you right off the top of my head, maybe the four or five people who regularly and thoughtfully disagree with me. And those people are solid gold because it's really easy to, you know, get high on your own supply, especially someone who's putting their views out into the world in a public way. You're automatically going to attract like-minded people. So you get this kind of like this, this, um, 
risk of groupthink, where people only bring ideas to you that you they know you're going to agree with. So I cherish you know, this handful of people who have the chutzpah to be like, mm, I don't know if you've thought that through very well, or that seems like a snap judgment, or what's the thinking behind that statement that you made. And, it, it, you know, it's hard, it's an ego bruise when someone does that. And you want to, you, the, part of your, part of your brain wants to avoid that and go away from it and go toward the people who are patting you on the back and saying, wow, you're so smart. And wow, that was such a great idea. And yes, I totally agree with you. But you know, that's, that's not a growth. That's not a growth mindset. So when, so having these people who are, like I said, thoughtfully, thoughtfully pushing back on ideas or concepts or plans or pricing or positioning or any, any sort of tactical move that you might make, I, I, I take a deep breath and I think, okay, maybe they're right. I disagree with this completely, but maybe they're right. Maybe this is a blind spot for me. And I'll say, okay, so let me say that back to you. What you're saying is, you know, and I try to reassert whatever their, what I think their position is, and then we make sure that we're on the same page. And then without necessarily agreeing with it out of hand or even commenting on it other than to say that, yes, I understand what you mean, I'll think about it. You know, maybe overnight, maybe it's, maybe it's a big deal, maybe it's not a big deal. But I'll give it five minutes and not immediately reject it out of hand. So for the listener, and we're kind of on a tangent here, but for the listener, <laughs> if you're if you're getting if you constantly are finding yourself rejecting advice from people who maybe are farther along than you, it's like, oh, that wouldn't work, or that wouldn't work for me. Give it a second. Like let it sink in, accept it, understand that it, you know, maybe you don't have to act on it, but at least accept it and consider it. And if possible, reach out to that person and ask for more information. And give it a chance. If you're feeling stuck, it's, it's, uh, it might be you that's got yourself stuck. Yep. Right, great advice. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. So I want to loop back to something you mentioned earlier, which, which was the reasons hourly billing is bad. I don't want to put you on the spot, but you know, oh, are yeah. there off the top of your head, like what are some of the, the reasons that you think hourly billing is bad for either the seller or the buyer? Um, my, my favorite one, because I'm sort of customer focused, um, is uh, billing by the hour. Let's start with the big one. Uh, it pits you against your client. It is completely a misalignment of interests. Let me explain. Um, you know, for you, you want to bill as many hours as possible. For them, they want you to bill as few hours as possible. Can anybody see the tension? You make money if, <laughs> if you bill more hours. Uh, you know, they get a better deal if you bill fewer. Like, what is wrong with this picture? And so, and, and by the way, like, so out of that, you know, comes like mistrust, right? Like, did that really take that long, right? Or does it have to take that long? And why did it take so long? And, you know, geez, I'm surprised by this bill or what have you. So, so all of that, it, all of that is, uh, is, is to the bad. I, I think another one of my, my favorite ones, and there's a bunch, but, uh, I'll, I'll maybe stop here for kicks is, um, most of the work, you know, we do and most of the work that people do if you build by the hour is, um, is, is sort of, I would say ultimately creative work. You know, people may yeah. disagree with this, but I would say a lawyer is creative. I right? agree. It's, I 100 it's knowledge agree. work. It's, it's, it's nonlinear. And mm -hmm. so, um, sometimes I get more done in, in 10 minutes than I get done in like 10 days. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's true of all of us. Sometimes you have that power hour, those power two hours, and then another time you don't. And so like as much as, you know, time can be measured in, you know, like 60 minute increments and, you know, 60 second intervals and all, all that sort of stuff, um, it doesn't mean the, the output is equal. And so uh, for those two reasons, you know, just as an opener, uh, I'll say billing by the hour is, is uh, bad news. Not to mention it's just like you're watching the clock and that's just no way to live. Yeah, everybody's focused on the wrong thing. They're staring at their shoes instead of where they're going. So it's, I, I want to pile on there. I completely agree with that. <clears throat> and I want to get a little bit tactical because people will say uh, when exposed to this idea, they'll say, well, what if the customer asks me how long it's going to take? And my, my answer to that generally is, well, is to turn it around and say, I don't know how long it's going to take. Why do you ask? Because it is, I agree with you. It is creative work. Pretty much anything you're doing, you know, online, digitally, it's basically boils down to creative work. And, and let, you know, there's some exceptions to that, but in general, and if they, a lot of times my experience is that when the client is asking how long it's going to take, they see that as a proxy for how much is it going to cost? 
because they are they're also used to the expectation of like, oh, this person is going to bill by the hour for their time, whether explicitly or implicitly, you know, whether it's been discussed yet. So let's say, well, how long is this going to take? There might not be an actual hard deadline. They're really asking how much is this going to cost? And if somebody comes to me and says, you know, hey, we want to do this project. It kind of looks like this. And then I, I sort of back them up and say, okay, well, why do you want to do it? Is Why did you decide to do it this way? Are you sure this is the best way? Does it really need to be done now? Why would you hire someone expensive like me? Go through all these questions, get all the answers to these questions and feel comfortable that this is going to be a mutually beneficial product uh, project that we're both going to profit from. And then they say something like, well, how long do you think it's going to take? I'll say, I don't know how long it's going to take. Why do you ask? And if they say, well, it needs to be done before the 2020 Olympics because this landing page needs to be up, then okay, that's a hard deadline. But if they say, well, we're just curious how much it's going to cost. I'm like, well, I'll I'll give you a price for the whole thing. You don't have to worry about that. Usually they'll be very, 90% of the time, they'll be fine with that. The exception being when they do have some kind of immovable deadline, like a conference or some sort of event that they're not in control of. So just sort of piling on there. Yeah, no, I think uh, yeah, there we are. We, we're uh, we're we're agreeing too much. We're going to have to find something to disagree about. But uh, for now, uh, what? Well, yeah, let's let's keep going. All right, so let's get to something. Maybe it's probably not sensitive, but let's just talk about it. What I'm curious about. I, I have a bookkeeper. I don't use Fresh Books. I would use Fresh Books if I did my own books. But what about the time tracking feature in there? Why is that there mm-hmm. if you're against this idea? Um, so a couple of, yeah, it's ironic, right? So you quote unquote sell time tracking, but, um, you write a book about (laughs) not tracking your time. So I think, um, a a couple of thoughts, uh, you know, first of all, as much as I would love the world to change, uh, you know, uh, at my uh, behest, it it doesn't, right? So there's lots of people out there who still track their time and, you know, it's the model they're comfortable with and maybe it's what their clients now expect and, Maybe it's their industry. Who knows? So there's there's people who need to track their time for those reasons. But I will also say this. For those who do not track time uh, to charge their clients, they may charge time to understand their expenses. Mm-hmm. And I actually think that that is uh, – so there's value in tracking time to understand like things like estimation. Like internally to, to, to plan out this client engagement, we thought the whole project would take 1,000 hours. Uh, let's see if it, it, it did, right? And so – but you may still have some, like, you may charge your client not based on hours, but you may still have some internal understanding of what you think it's going to take. And so tracking your time becomes an important thing to understand, like, you know, is the margin at the end of the day what we thought it was going to be? Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's, that's, that, and that's why it's in there. So it's either, hey, it's still your revenue model, or alternatively, it's just a good discipline on the cost side, because if you're selling services, it kind of is all about time and utilization and those kinds of things. Perfect segue into, and you feel free to say you don't want to answer this because it might be uh, proprietary information, but you are also a customer of this kind of work. You know, I'm sure you have employees and perhaps contractors or a combination of both who work on the product. Do they okay. charge you by the hour? Um, well, the week, uh, so no, we usually do engagements, right? Hey, here's the project. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but, you know, to be honest, I would say, uh, you know, I don't know if this is uh, a point of pride so much as now just the reality is, uh, that's, it, it's not so much, uh, what I, what I'm doing. I, I'm sure we have a variety of uh, people we work with in a variety of different ways. And, uh, we don't always dictate how they bill us. That's generally, you know, whoever's providing the service says, Hey, here's how I'm going to uh, bill you for it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you have a preference or do you not even, does it not matter? Um, you know, I think most of us want competent work done, you know, at a you know reasonable price, right. To, sure. to the value. So, so I, I don't know that I, uh, you know, philosophically anyone who's not charging sort of based on their value, you know, I'm like, geez, I want to help you. Um, but you know, that's, you know, maybe you don't know you, would want to be helped. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. So, so it's, uh, I, you know, I, I try not to be, uh, you know, judgmental about it. Yeah. You don't um, want to be too parochial. Say, yeah. Pr- most people that we're working with, they're kind of evolved beyond this point. I'd say like, I can't think of any vendor I'm aware of. Our lawyers might be the, the, the mm-hmm. non-example, but even mm-hmm. there in some cases we've had people say, Hey, for these standardized things, I'm just going to charge you a flat rate every time. 
right? And that's that's great. And sometimes you know they lose their shirt on it, and sometimes they make you know incredible margin. Um, on the whole, we both know what the cost is going to be and what we're expecting as a finished product. So okay, that's a great point. So when you you know being uh, someone who subscribes to this worldview, I imagine, but correct me if I'm wrong, that you spend a fair amount of time describing to anybody that you're writing checks to, regardless of how they're charging you for that, that this is the desired outcome. This is the desired business outcome. Yes. And so, yeah, we might be swiveling into some other parts of a potential conversation here, but absolutely. I want to know what I'm getting. Right. Right. Like I don't want a, um, well, we'll just march in this direction until your you know, bank account runs dry. It's yes. like, no, <laughs> that's, that's let's, the problem. Let, let's determine what the uh, outcome is and then go from there. Yeah, because my experience, the reason I bring it up is because uh, for someone like you, it's p- probable that it kind of doesn't matter because you you know, you sort of like you would see the red flags as opposed to, and believe me, I built by the hour for years. You know, it's been a, a decade since then, but I remember it clearly uh, that people would be in some sort of urgent situation and they would come flying through our door and can you start work right this second uh and we'd be like okay our rate's 150 dollars an hour where should we start hammering and they would say hammer over there you know and dig a hole over there and all of a sudden they're driving the project and then fifty thousand dollars later they're like i've spent fifty thousand dollars with you and i've got nothing to show for it and it's like you could kind of blame the client in that situation and a lot of people do but I, bl- I blame the professional. I think the professional takes the blame there for, for taking, you know, for not calming the person down, doing a proper diagnosis of the situation, and then moving forward with an agreed upon prescription and therapy. So, you know, act, uh, my advice is once you're beyond the, you know, beginning fledgling f- freelancer phase and you want to actually level up and be more of a consultant and be a partner with your clients, you need to act like a doctor and first do no harm, do a diagnosis confirm that if they are self-prescribing a therapy that it's a good one and if it's not you should push back and suggest a different one and if they won't accept that you should work with someone else so for someone like you who's hip to all this i would imagine that that solves a lot of problems that smooths a lot of things over regardless of creating bill by the hour or not the my fear would be for my fear is for people who don't see that and just come in with their hair on fire and it's like something must be done okay, we're doing something great. Something has been done. And then when the bank accounts dry, then the lawyers get pulled out. So a little soapbox I have action for you, but sorry about that, yeah. but that's the, yeah. that's the yeah. fear. Yeah. I, um, it, it happens, right. And, uh, there's blame on, on all sides, right. It's not a responsible business practice. It's, you know, to like behave in that way, show up and say, give me stuff and, and what have you. And it's, by the way, it's buyer beware. Like you engage me, you know, like that's, that's actually on you as a purchaser potentially, but also, yeah, if the professional is going to say, okay, well, these folks just want to spend money and they don't seem to care how and I'm not going to steer them correctly. You know, anyhow, I, I, you said it well, I think we're, uh, we found another point of agreement. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. So there's a, uh, there's a line early on in the, so in the, in the book, the sort of, you know, Steve, our our hero is having a hard time at the beginning and then he meets this person karen who has the different worldview and she describes to him you know he he's like wait how she describes to him that there's another way to price you could actually price your work instead of just billing for your labor and he's like confused and she says well you know what do you do for for clients and he says well i build websites for him she's like do those websites deliver any kind of business value to your customers and he's like yeah sure and she's like, well, how much? And he's like, what do you mean? You know, he's like very confused by the concept. And it sort of goes back and forth in a way that listeners to this podcast would be thoroughly familiar. And he says something like, well, don't don't people push back and, and wonder how many hours it's going to take you to deliver those results and then kind of do the math and divide it out and say like, holy moly, we paid you like $1,000 an hour for, for 500 hours. And her response is great. I actually wrote it down. It's, she says, I'm the accumulation of all my skills and talents. I'm wisdom and creativity. I've stopped seeing myself as a punch card. So I, I absolutely love this. And it's like, a, it's like, a, you know, it's like a Spielberg movie moment. <laughs> but at the same time, I know people listening are like, they don't believe it. And 
And they can imagine customers who would just be like, uh, no, we're prepared to pay you by the hour and we want to know your hourly rate. So if you were going to advise someone in a situation like that, is there a way that they can navigate that client? Is there a way to turn the client's mind around or should they just move on? Yeah, I think, I think you have to choose your clients, right? And I think your career as a professional starts out in a world where you can't and you'll take anybody. And then you build up to a place where you have too many. And then you get to a place where you start editing down to the kinds you want and exclusively want. Um, and so there's a whole journey there, but you know, ultimately you want to get to a place where you say, you know, actually, no, this isn't how I work. Uh, now, if you, it's your first client, you're staring down there, like you may not, like you may just take the client and go and I, you know, I will not judge you for that because you got to get started somewhere. Um, but, but over, over time, you want to get to a place where, you know, if people won't, you know, like I, I would say it's a flag for me if my client's going to tell me how I charge for my work. Right. And if I can't reorient the conversation to listen, like, let's stop talking about the hours and how much cost. What is it that you want when I'm done? Right. That's the only thing we need to align on that. And then whatever I tell you it's going to cost, you know, that's where the decision becomes yours. Right. Uh, so we're going to start. <laughs> that's out a great with, way to put it. You, you tell me what you need. Right. And I'm going to tell you how I'm good. Like, I'm not even going to get into details too much. I'm going to come back with a cost to get you to that place. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or say, I can't, I don't know how, and you know, I'm not the right person, mm -hmm. right? But maybe I can introduce you to somebody or, or whatever. I, I think that's actually a very good answer. And I think the third answer would be like, Hey, I actually don't really enjoy working with you. I, I may not tell you that. Mm -hmm. I might just say, Hey, you know, our firm's not a fit with your project and maybe you want to find somebody else. Right. So, so I, I think you're in one of those three paths. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, but, but, um, but yeah, I think, I think there's a steering to these conversations that's, that's necessary and, uh, and appropriate. Yeah, I totally agree. It's, that's great stuff. And there's also, I'll just call out because I know people are thinking it. Uh, there are clients who you, you'll say, well, you just tell me what, what you want to accomplish and I'll give you a price for that. And there'll be, there'll be clients who are like, I don't know the answer to that question and yeah. it just get to work. Well, yeah. And so then I, so then it's like, great. I will not do that because I think it'll be bad for you. Mm -hmm. What I will do is I will invest. Let, let me come back to the proposal for how I would help you figure out what it is that you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's actually one of the best engagements to start with is like, listen, let's spend 20 grand that you probably have a $200,000 project here, but I will help you. Like I'll even write a proposal that you can take out to other people if you want, but I will help you pull out what it is you're trying to accomplish. I'll charge you 20 grand for that. By the way, if you get this first 20 grand contract, it's an almost a sure thing that they're going to want to work with you because you're going to know the stuff better than anybody. But, but actually I would rather take that $20,000 contract and then not proceed with them than, you know, than not know what it is that's success for them, how they think they're going to get there. Like, cause then you almost have no, ch like, first of all, you're applying your precious time and effort, you know, in a way that like when you're done, you don't even know if you're going to be successful. And like, how frustrating is that? Right. Forget the financials. It's mm -hmm. like, well, I did all this work. I worked really hard and nobody's happy. Like, I don't want to live in that world. Uh, others may, that'd be great. I'll take the money. I'm not interested. <laughs> so, so I want to know that if I'm actually spending my time working, uh, to help you achieve your goals, that, you know, that I can be successful when I'm done. Uh, and if I don't know that it's, you know, it's like, I will spend some time at your on your nickel to help figure that out um you know sometimes people even say i'll spend the time with you i'm not even gonna charge you for it and at the end of it we'll come out with a proposal uh, i think you got to be very confident you're going to wind up getting some business out of that i like charging for it so people take it seriously if you don't hang a price tag on your time and your effort then people will start to see you as a either a doormat or something like that uh, which is not not healthy uh you know there are exceptions to every rule but I, i'm a fan of Hey, part of my value is going to help you understand what you need so you can articulate it to yourself and others. There's, there's value in that. Yes. Another point where we violently agree. So let's shift a little bit into positioning. So how, do, how does positioning play into someone's ability to attract enough clients and be financially successful enough so that they can actually say no to the ones that they believe are a bad fit? Okay. And so just so you know, I found uh, positioning is a watch word for me that means lots of things to lots of people. So, so unpack its meaning uh, in this context. In this context, I would say the, uh, the thing that someone would say to a friend they were recommending you to. So if, if somebody said, was going to say mm -hmm. a, a client was going to, was talking to a friend 
and said, Hey, uh, you need to talk to Mike. He does this like they, that you're known as an authority at a particular thing or outcome or technology or serving a particular vertical, but you have this pigeonhole that you're in that somebody can articulate easily. So I think, you know, my answer to that question, then I'll go into probably more what you're looking for, but it's like, this is Mike. He solved all of our problems. We wouldn't know where, what to do without him. And I, I'm like, and we had this happen a lot of times is like, I, I pretty much don't want to tell you that he exists, uh, but I'm <laughs> going to, right? Like that's, those are the clients. Like I had lots of clients who are like, I don't want to tell anybody about you. I will. And I have, but, but I don't because I don't want you to be busy. Right. I want you to be available when I call. Um, and, uh, and we found a way to, to do both, but, but, um, uh, you know, so I, I think where you're going is a bit of, you know, sort of whether it be specialization, uh, is kind of where I hear this, this, this kind of question is like, it could be, you know, like it, I, I, in, in a business I run today, I call it moving beyond averages. But, um, you know, if let's say you are a consultant, are you a consultant for any business and every business? Are you, let's, let's say you're a marketing consultant. Are you a marketing consultant for every industry and any industry? Uh, let's say you're a marketing consultant for an industry, right? Like maybe it's automotive. Okay. Um, and then it's like, well, do you work helping to sell cars or is it on like the supply chain? Cause those are different problem sets. Hmm. And, and what, what starts to happen is, um, and this is the, the thing about specialization. When you start to work for a client and you go really deep with them and you're helping them solve business problems. So you're not just doing stuff for them, but you're actually okay, let me sit on your side of the table, see the world from your view. It's like, maybe it's like you have this much budget and you're trying to move, you know, drive this kind of business outcome. Okay, that's helpful. Okay, so now I know you're trying to drive business outcome. You have this many dollars. I can help you do this. Like, help me understand what the metrics are that you measure. I had lots of engagements where people, like, didn't have any metrics or measures. So it's like, great, Mm -hmm. let's help you build those. Let's track them for a while. Then let's see how to influence them. But but, um, where I'm really going with that story is, once you serve a client in that way, that is, you know, I'm, I'm espousing a value-based billing. You could be charging by the hour, but for me, it's like I'm partnering with you to achieve a business outcome. We're going to sit on the same side of the table. We're going to, you know, figure out what the problem is and how to solve it. Mm-hmm. Once I do that for a, a, a customer in an industry, I get a bunch of domain knowledge that um, it would be great if I could take it to another business like this mm-hmm. right and 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 not a competitive business like there's you know there's there's tons of businesses you know like let's take retail like there's all kinds of retailers um you know and they don't all compete with each other so one might be you know a grocery store another might be a clothing store another like there's all kinds of retailers so this is right. not about taking knowledge and you know taking it to your client's competitor it's about well now that i'm consistently working with retail businesses I recognize they all have these kinds of challenges, staffing, our scheduling, right? You know, concerned with petty theft. Like Mm -hmm. these are examples. I'm not sure they're, you know, relevant to whatever business you're in. The the point is you start to go deeper on the problems in that industry and, and get a feel eventually actually for like the temperature of that industry. And, and the value of all that is when you do an engagement with a client, like you can rapidly demonstrate value to them. Mm-hmm. You can rapidly help them achieve outcomes and you can bring them a layer of value that you don't get when it's your first engagement in that industry. And so, so the, the ironic thing about all this is like, let's say I decide I'm going to focus on, I don't know, restaurants. Okay. Right. And I go in, I do my first engagement serving a restaurant as let's say a marketing consultant. Um, I help that restaurant. I, I learn about those things. If I do two or three restaurants, I'm starting to get pretty good at this and I can help you think things through menu design. Like, like, do you need, you know, like is 40 choices better than seven? Well, I did some research. Turns out seven's better. Fewer choices, simpler, faster, right? So, so that I'm offering value in the first engagement when I meet my fourth client, right? It's like, well, here's some things I've learned and that builds confidence. So they want to buy you. You've already done the learning and the homework from those other engagements. So you can, you can actually spend less time and more competent and confidently deliver value to that client. And so they're going to have a better chance of like, hey, you said you do this. You actually did it. Uh, it worked for me. I'm going to refer you on. And so you start to build this flywheel, mm-hmm. right? Like you go in, you serve a client, you drive a room, you get 
more knowledge, you become more confident, the next client comes to you, it's easier for them to buy, you can charge more while doing less and deliver a better outcome for them. And then and then more people like them start showing up. And it's very counterintuitive. Uh, you know, I think people want to be positioned so anyone can buy them, but the world is busy and cluttered. It's far better to like, you know, think about like a market of one, mm-hmm. right? Like how do I perfectly describe that customer? Because you know what, there's not one of them. There's like probably you know a thousand and they just haven't all found you yet and they will in time. Yes. Yeah. I mean, look, (laughs) this is probably a good place to leave it because we are agreeing yet again on another important point. But I am glad to have you here because you're articulating it in a different way and from a different perspective, which hopefully will lend credibility to, you know, the soapbox that I'm on all the time anyway. So, you know, it's not just me, folks. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, good deal. If I've offered some... uh... I helped you solve one of your problems today, then uh, then I've I've done something. So <laughs> thank you for that. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, okay, Mike. So where can people find out more about you online? Um, well, first of all, if you send invoices, um, please check out FreshBooks. You can do that. Uh, get your own free account at uh, FreshBooks.com. And again, it's cloud-based accounting software on your mobile phone, desktop, all that kind of thing. Um, and if you're interested in uh, breaking the time barrier, again, it's a free ebook. Uh, you can download it for free. It, uh, it takes about an hour to read. And if it doesn't like the, the power of it and what I'm actually not every, you know, like some pieces of work over my life, I'm more proud of than others. I'm very proud of the book because I, I think it actually does a good job taking people on the mental journey that we've touched on in this call, um, or this uh, podcast, I guess. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, uh, and for that, I think, uh, and I've received, you know, many notes over the years from people saying, wow, this completely changed my game and helped them actually, uh, you know, charge more and, and communicate with clients more confidently. And all of that's hard uh, with this this kind of work. So so please do check that out. If it's not the most al- valuable hour uh, of uh, of your month or your week or your year, uh, I will. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to eat my hat, but uh, I'll, I'll <laughs> Just, be uh, I'll be disappointed. Hopefully it'll be helpful. No, I, pl- I plus one on that. It's absolutely worth the time. It's it's a, a novel and engaging way to present these concepts that I think uh, you know, in the story format, it just, it just really clicks with the the human brain. So very well done. I, I applaud your efforts. Thank you. Um, all right. So that's it for this week. I'm Jonathan Stark, and this has been Ditching Hourly. I hope to see you again next time. Thanks again, Mike. Thanks all. Thanks, Jonathan. If you'd like to learn more about how to ditch hourly billing, please go to valuepricingbootcamp.com to sign up for my free email course. Again, that URL is valuepricingbootcamp.com. Thanks.